This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can express your concerns on the child welfare system here in the nation and actually we've had a few people on from around the globe. Today I want to get right to our program because I, I had the chance to sit down with a young lady from Presque uh, Isle. Michigan, and um, her name is uh, Liana Little Tubler, and um, I'd like to welcome her to the show. Hello, Liana, via Google Hangouts. Thank you for having me on the show, Dennis. Well, I will say you certainly have a well-documented case here, uh, thumbing through all of your files. Now, uh, you were living in a separate homestead at the time of your first hearing. The father of your children admitted in court that he had committed first-degree child abuse, and you being separated received full custody of the children. How did CPS come involved in your life? As a result of that, they ended up giving me my children and at the same time unlawfully court-ordering me DHS supervision. As a result of this court-ordered DHS supervision, I was forced to allow them into my home. And if I didn't, I would have been jailed for contempt of court, and they would have took my children anyways. Uh, four months after your sons were removed, you had another court hearing. Am I correct? At that particular hearing, worker CA was proven to have lied on the stand about the true nature of my son's medical condition while in foster care. It was proven in the court of law. The foster mother was a registered nurse. She gave my 13-month-old son amoxicillin without informing me she did this. She did not take him to a doctor. She did not take him to an ER. She did not take him to a walk-in. She didn't even give him Benadryl. Instead, she continued to pump the amoxicillin down my helpless 13-month-old son, Freddie's throat. Despite the fact it was also proven in court, he'd been broken out in hives for days. The day that I found my son was in this condition, I had a visit that morning at a doctor's office, and it was for an appointment for his one-year wellness check I had set up just one month earlier. They brought me my sons, and I looked at my, my youngest at the time, because Gideon was not born yet, and I asked, what the hell is wrong with my son? And the worker's like, what do you mean? And I'm looking over my son, I'm looking over him, I said, what is he taking? And the minute I, I, she said amoxicillin, you know, worker JML, we'll call her. Worker JML tells me he's on amoxicillin, and I said, that's it. That's it right there. That's what it is. That's what is causing these hives. That's why he's having breathing problems and in the beginning stages of anaphylaxis right now. And she tries to tell me, in the, in the waiting room of this doctor's office, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. We'll see what the doctor has to say, and wouldn't you know. The doctor 
their doctor that they use confirmed it. Worker CA, who was JML's supervisor, lied on the stand about the nature of his reaction, claiming it was a mild reaction, when in fact, I managed to produce papers from their own doctor proving it was a severe allergic reaction. He further tried claiming I was emotionally unstable because of how I reacted to the situation. And my attorney at the time, Laura Green, said to Mr. C.A., do you have children? He says, yes. I have five. And she looks at this worker and says, what if this was one of your kids? And he said, I'd be pissed. And she looks at the worker and she says, but you call her emotionally unstable because she flipped out. When have my client's children ever been in this kind of jeopardy in her care? They haven't been. So we managed to prove this foster mother, who was an, also a registered nurse, medically neglected my son in court to the brink of death. This same hearing, it was admitted by worker CA that the only issue they had with me was unfit home due to 12 Cheez-Its and six toys on the floor and a couple other items involved. He admits that issue is resolved. So he admits the only issue they had with me and why they removed my children was resolved. So why does he come up with the, well, we have a new issue now. She has no driver's license, but she has reliable transportation. Wait a minute. First of all, it's illegal to use the fact someone doesn't have a driver's license against them in order to keep their children. Secondly. Doesn't the fact worker CA admits that I have reliable transportation negate his complaint of me having a driver's license? This would mean this worker just admitted they have absolutely nothing on me. Yet despite this, Judge McLennan placed my children right back into the very home of the foster family that was just proven in his courtroom to have almost killed my child via medical neglect. Why couldn't they send my sons back home with me? Plenty of parents have their children sent back home and continue services with CPS and CFS or whatever three-letter acronym agency they're going through all the time. So why couldn't mine be returned? After all, it was just admitted and proven in court they had nothing on me. This is child endangerment committed by a judge, people. Why would you knowingly stick children back into a house that was just proven to have almost killed one of them after the mother has been proven to clearly be more fit. Ever since that happened, I woke up every morning wondering, are my sons alive or dead? So all issues in the original complaint were resolved, but there was a new issue. Then you were given a new attorney. Yes, I was. I was given a new attorney his name is Donald Dowling, and I was given this attorney after this hearing that we just discussed, and after this hearing occurred, I had actually discussed with Laura Green and exposed to her we were, in fact, legally separated and living in separate homes at the time my ex-husband got caught. She said, well then, they had no right to legally drag you into this case in the first place. We're going to be addressing this at the next hearing, and from what I know and the law that I know, it's going to be dismissed. 
Well, wouldn't you know, before that hearing occurred, my attorney, Laura Green, I can't verify the validity of this, supposedly retired, but she is now working again, and I was given Donald Dowling. I brought this up to Donald Dowling, what Laura Green said she was going to be doing. He dismissed it entirely. He never even addressed this, that we were legally separated and living in separate homes at the time my ex-husband got caught. If he had, this case would have been closed and my children would have been returned home. So this is what we call ineffective assistance of counsel at this point. So I went from having an attorney who was willing to fight for me and my children to one who basically wouldn't. He got pregnant in July of 2014 and March of 2015 went into labor. What happened with the child and what were you accused of? My child, Gideon Constantine Little, was born March 30th, 2015. He was born healthy. He was originally born dead. I had a lot of complications with this pregnancy that were life-threatening. Uh, these complications included placenta previa, placental abruption, a subchorionic hematoma between my uterus and my placenta wall that if ruptured would kill us both, could kill us both. And I managed to go full term, and I was four days late. Everything was fine with Gideon until I went into labor, and his heart suddenly crashed twice. Till this day, doctors do not know why, but we suspect that one of his blood vessels was pinched off during labor, and it caused his heart to stop. My own doctor, Brendan Convoy, and the nurses and everybody had talked to my son's guardian ad litem, Michael Vogler, and confirmed what had happened during delivery was not as a result of my doing. You know, tests confirmed he was perfectly healthy. When he was born, he was placed on my chest, lifeless. A crash team had been called in twice to restart his heart. He was born dead. And all I could do was sit there and stroke, and stroke my son's lifeless head and begging him to come back. I told him, I said, you survived this entire life-threatening pregnancy, please don't give up now, sweetheart. Please don't give up now. And the next thing we all knew, the most loudest scream came out of him. And I did nothing but thank God that he pulled through death. God brought back my baby. And three weeks earlier, before his birth, there was a hearing. And the attorneys asked worker JML if she had any intention on sticking my child in the foster home with his brothers. She said, absolutely not. So I was not expecting a hearing to occur. Because she admitted in court she had no intention of taking my son. Then I find out my attorney at this hearing had said, because I was in the hospital because of preterm labor at the time this hearing occurred, I was not there, my ex-husband was there, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, my son's grandparents were there. You know, I had everybody else there for me. And my attorney said, well, Your Honor, if she's fit to have one, 
than she's fit to have them all. So the very next morning after my son was born, I went in for a tubal ligation, which is classified as a major surgery, and I was because I was distributed anesthesia. And because of this, law states they cannot have any kind of hearing for 24 hours after a major surgery. Well, they didn't follow that law. Instead, they had this hearing not even two hours after I came out of major surgery for a tubal ligation. They accused me of neglect on my newborn baby who was born six pounds, seven ounces, 20 inches long, perfectly healthy, all 10 fingers and toes, no drugs, no alcohol, no, no medications, no nothing was in his system. He was not only breastfed at the hospital, but he was supplemented formula as well because I had the surgery. I didn't want the anesthesia leaking through my breast milk and into my child. So I supplemented him formula. This worker was caught, worker JML to be specific, was caught lying not once but twice on the stand within the first 10 minutes of this hearing. Not only was she caught lying, she admitted she lied. Then she proceeded to complain that I would be breastfeeding and not taking medication. The judge sided with me and court ordered me to breastfeed and not take pills because not only would breastfeeding be healthier for my son, but it would be healthier for me, because I'd be 10 times less likely to get postpartum depression if I breastfed. And Judge McClendon was this close to sending my son home with me until Prosecutor Rick Steiger said, well, she has two others in foster care. If something happens to him, it's your fault. Bear in mind, I never abused my children. They never had abuse on me on my children. They accused me of neglect on my children. Till this day, I have never been charged with neglect. And yet I'm still on the central registry for neglect. They managed to take my child from my hospital bed. I was devastated. I could not believe it. From what I knew, he was going home with me. From what I knew, I was not expecting this at all. You know, one day my child's born, bed, born dead and God brings him back to me only for the very next day for the state to take him. And that's not supposed to mess me up. Shortly after you have had a FTM meeting, what happened there? That meeting, I was set up, the worker had set that up for my birthday. Mind you, that meeting was supposed to occur a week after. I had asked the worker if I could have a family visit for my birthday three days prior to it occurring. She moved the FTM from the following week to that day. She admitted in court she knew she was going to be addressing terminating our parental rights at this FTM. So why on earth would you set this FTM for right after my birthday party? For one. For two, we were able to prove in court she called the cops in advance to be outside the door. When my attorney asked how did the visit go prior to this meeting, and she said, oh, it went wonderful. He's like, then why did you call the cops? And she's like, well, we feared, I feared for my safety. He said, why? Because you were going to address their, that you're terminating the parental rights knowing they just had a family birthday for their mother's birthday? And she's like, yeah. 
And furthermore, she proceeds to begin with me in this meeting. And no sooner do we start it, she slanders me, calling me a slut in this, in this meeting, accusing me of sleeping with four different men in this meeting. And it was proven in court via DNA that the judge made the state pay for because they accused me of being a slut. DNA confirmed. I told the judge. On July 16th, you had a trial for jurisdiction of your son, Gideon. It was for jurisdiction of my youngest son. Yes, people, they didn't even have jurisdiction of my youngest son for four months. And yet, he was never in my care. They took him. Without having jurisdiction, they had to file for that four months later. Uh, you had a termination hearing that was uh, delayed three times and should have actually been delayed a fourth time as uh, the judge had broken his foot. And at this jury trial, I proved the extortion. I proved the malicious attacks. They held over me the overdose. They used it against me, knowing it happened as a result of extortion. I proved a lot of mass corruption. I also proved that the worker, JML, had my son's medical records for 15 months and intentionally withheld them from the prosecutor in attempts to make her allegation, I starved my children, believable. To the prosecutor's dismay, he was shocked to discover not only did medical records prove that was a lie, but they proved my sons had a medical condition known as gastroesophageal reflux disease to the point they both had failure to thrive before they were removed from me. My rights were terminated November 12, 2015, they originally set my TPR for August 2012, I mean 2015, delayed it to October 2015, and then delayed it again to November 12, 2015, just two days prior to my TPR. They switched my judge on me. Mind you, Judge McLennan handled my case the entire time. Their excuse was he fell off a ladder and broke his foot. You delayed my TPR twice. Why can't you delay it a third time so the proper judge who actually oversaw this case could handle it? And from what I know, I was denied a delay. That's what I heard from my attorney. I don't know how true that is because I wasn't there. But that's what I was informed, that I was denied a delay. As a result of this, I realized what was happening, that they had flipped my judge because they knew if Judge McLennan sat in that chair, I was going to win. Because of this, I was left with two options. They made it clear they were not giving me my children back. That is quite evident since they came after me illegally from day one and continued to do nothing but illegal acts to keep my children from me. All the way down to now flipping my judge. This left me with either A, sign over under duress, but what they call voluntary, knowing that my children could find me before, I'm eight, before they're 18 and I could have contact with them, and still be able to try to get this case reopened, or B, allow them to forcefully take my rights and have no chance of seeing my children till they're 18. So I took option A. Was it considered voluntary, voluntary in their eyes? Yes, even on the paper. It asks 
you know, am I signing this willingly and not under duress? And despite the fact I signed it anyways, I was in fact under duress. I made that clear when the judge asked me why I was signing over. I said, Your Honor, clearly my children are not coming home with me, are not going to. I believe all the corruption in this case has proven that. My upbringing in the system, myself being stolen by CPS in 1990, I have suffered severe mental and emotional trauma. These people have inflicted the same trauma on my children to the point my son's been now seeing a shriek since he was two for adjustment anxiety disorder. There's no way on God's green earth I am going to allow my children to live a lifetime full of mental and emotional trauma caused at the same hands that did it to their own mother, the Michigan system. Not if I have anything to do with it. My oldest is about to turn five, about to turn four, and he has a chance to heal from this. And I have to give him that chance. Because if I don't, he could be traumatized forever. And there's no way I'm going to allow my boys, my babies, my cubs to live with what I have to. So I signed over under duress for the sake of my children's mental and emotional health. And because I had made them each a promise before they were even born that they would have 10 times of a better life than I ever did. And I would ensure. And this was the only way I could ensure them. Well, Elena, I, I, I'm very sorry about what the state of Michigan has put you and your family through. And it's like to personally thank you for coming on Silent Voices. And your voice will be heard. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank you, the viewer, for watching this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same station. Until next week, my friends, remember, your voice will make the difference.